I met your father two times uh, in an international conference. And uh, I think it was one time with the national team. And uh, I know also what he did in Barcelona. I know he was one of the really greatest player. But what he did as a coach and what he developed in Barcelona, I saw, I would say, yeah, 10 or 15 or 20 years later, that always they're speaking back from your father in La Masia and also about the total footballer. What he created is for me amazing. And they tried also to get this information. But uh, how is this for you as a son? Uh, how, how, how it is uh, in your career um, to be the son of one of the greatest player and the son of one of, I would say, best coaches? Well, I think, uh, first of all, as a, like, as a son, uh, you know, you always admire your father, you love him. Uh, and of course, when I hear the name Johan Cruyff, for me, it's my father. I don't see him as a, specifically as a football person. But there's not one day that uh, I get reminded the inspiration that he was for uh, different generations, you know, like uh, for the ones who saw him as a football player, for the ones who saw him as a, as a coach, uh, for others who, who've known him as a person, everybody uh, always speaks in a very, um, like in a very inspiring uh, way. And I can only say that as a son, I'm, I'm super proud of, uh, of him, of course. And uh, my father was, uh, I think was a, a person who, first of all, he was very courageous, uh, always stood for what he believed, his principles of life which he also saw in, in his football. He never changed that. And uh, I've tried many times because uh, I love to argue and uh, he also liked to argue. So a lot of times we, you know, we, you try to get in a discussion because it was really interesting. When my father was getting angry or frustrated, that's when he spoke the most clear. And that's when you learn the most. So I always had to kind of uh, try to provoke him to, to really get the, the real football answers, you know, the ones that he really believed in. But one of the questions that I always uh, remember is uh, the 74, the final, in which I always mentioned to him, you know, like, uh, what, would, what do you prefer, you know, to have that gold medal, which you didn't get, or to have the second position and, and getting all the respect that he got? And he always said, the World Cup uh, 74 is not won by Holland, but everybody speaks about what we did in that World Cup, the way we played football. And... When you check in YouTube or, or on internet, uh, some of the offside that they were trying to do in 1974, I mean, if you look at it now, it's just unbelievable that this happened so many years ago. And the offside, I mean, they, they used to press with eight or nine players uh, to, to, to the opponent with the ball, which was a bit unseen um, in that time. So, but my father always, uh, he said his biggest uh, prize was not that gold, like the gold medal. It was that people people's total football at Holland started and also people remember his uh, his way of football than the amount of titles that he won and I can assure you uh, it was not a diplomatic answer it was absolutely his his belief I believe it I have been sometimes in Spain and uh, I believe it because it's an amazing base what he what he did there in the theory I think it's till now uh, a religion in, in, in football. But uh, an additional question is, um, how was he as a coach with the players? Was he um, strict or, or, or very dominant? Or was he more communicating or the relationship important for him? Because I said it, I met him two times and I didn't know him personally. I think uh, he had one huge advantage over... 99% of, uh, of the coaches nowadays, that hen, when he explained uh, what he wanted and what he expected from a player in training, and you would see the player opening his eyes, thinking, okay, you know, you're asking something impossible, then he had the capacity to say, give me the ball and I will show you. And he would do it on the highest level because he just had that, that capacity to do it on the highest level. And of course, when a player of 25 or 26 suddenly sees uh, that uh, a coach of, I don't know, uh, reaching his 45, 50 years old can actually, uh, uh, can actually uh, show it with the ball, 
you know, like show the exercise in front of everyone. Yeah, as a 24 year, 25 year old, you just say, okay, if he can do it at his age, then uh, I can also try to do it. So he could convince people not only by, uh, by speaking, but also by actually showing it. Say, give me the ball, I will show you how to do this. And he would do it. And I remember that as a little boy watching the trainings, especially in Barcelona at that time, where I, I probably have a better memory. And uh, I used to focus on that, and it was amazing. And he would actually play uh, the, the possession game. Sometimes he would participate at the rondos. And, uh, you know, he would just enjoy it above all, but he would still have the extra quality, you know, uh, better than, than most active or many active players. So I think that was a big advantage. But my father was also an understanding person. Uh, I'll always remember Romario uh, asking, because it was the, the holidays and the famous holidays in, in Brazil, the carnival, and he was asking permission uh, to leave. And my father told him, okay, if you score two goals, I'll let you go. And uh, what he didn't expect is that Romario already scored two goals in the first half. So at halftime, he went to my father and he said, coach, I already scored two goals and my flight is leaving in one and a half hour. And my father could have said no, but that was also my father that he said, you know what, you're right, you scored your two goals, catch your flight and he left. And imagine, you know, that was my father also as a coach. That's why I think a lot of uh, football players thought he was a tough coach, a demanding coach, but they also saw the other side, the human side of him and uh, the understanding side towards the players. And I think... That's probably one of the things that, uh, that that's why they still speak a lot about him. There's a lot of anecdotes which are not really well known, but trust me, there is a lot of them that brings a smile in your face. Does it come in and I think uh, you can do it because I, I'm not sure if I'm right. You did the uh, coach education in Israel and in Spain. So you did some parts in Spain and some parts here yeah. in Israel. Yeah. So you have a good comparison also about uh, a coach education and you worked as a sports director uh, with uh, many Israeli coaches in uh, Tel Aviv. So if we compare, for example, Spanish coaches and Israeli coaches, um, is there a difference? Can you give advices to our coaches here? Uh, what is your opinion about uh, coach education? Uh, the whole situation here, uh, in Israel, comp in comparison to to Spain, a top country in football. I think the I, I just think the main difference or the main disadvantage that the Israeli coaches will probably have, it's that it's difficult for them to compare uh, their beliefs or their method to others in other countries. Um, for example, in 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 in, in case. I don't know, countries like, uh, like Holland uh, or Germany, they have a lot of neighbors, you know, and there's a lot of leagues that you can associate with, you can play friendly games with. Uh, there is a much more direct kind of uh, communication line. You compare things because comparing means that you see other things which you don't do. And it, it gives you a, a more wide perspective. It, it gives you the chance to see different things and believe different things. And I think... That is the main disadvantage that, uh, that the Israeli coaches have because in the end we're in Israel, we're a little bit further away uh, geographically than, than you know, other countries who, who have much more easy uh, geography with neighbors and that you can kind of compare yourself and to see what are they doing right, what are we doing wrong, what can we improve in, what are we better in than, than, than our neighbors. And I think that is something that uh, for sure makes things a little bit more difficult here. Also the fact uh, when you're a youth coach, for example, that you can play, which is very common in, in, in other European countries is to play youth tournaments and uh, you play four or five a year. And that is actually the moment you compare how you work, how the opponents work, what solution do they find to a problem and what are you doing to the problem? And that's where you can test your differences. And I think the geography is, is a part that makes things a little bit more difficult for Israeli coaches. That's why I think when Israeli coaches have had the, the, the luck and, 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 and they, they probably deserved it, that they have been working in, in foreign countries and foreign leagues. When they come back, I do believe that they have kind of, you know, a different view on things that they had before they left. So I, I do encourage, you know, when it's possible, always to 
go abroad and to learn from others. That's also why I'm quite happy when I look back that I've actually uh, done the course, the coaching course in, in two, three different countries. You know, so I've been able to learn different things from, from different football views. I think very important, and we also try to do it now in coach education to make uh, hospitations for the coaches to go abroad to see, to to see the the European football, and to improve. Um, sports director or coach? What is your future? What do you like more? Um, <laughs> that's a difficult question. First of all, I love football. So I've, I like, and I also think it's a good experience to sit on, on different parts of the table. You know, uh, I've, I've been the, the football player for some years uh, with better and worse years, just like everybody else. Uh, then I've been the sport director, which I kind of, uh, you learn to think also in a club, you try to find the right balance between the short-term thoughts of a, of a coach, plus the medium and the long-term thoughts of, of an owner especially the owner of Maccabi Tel Aviv, who really wanted to implement something in the club. He was not uh, desperate for short-term results. He was really looking forward to, to, to a strategy for the longer term. And then, of course, like trying uh, the coaching part, which, let's be honest, nowadays, it's, uh, even if you want to think short, uh, I mean, middle term, it's, you're not guaranteed anything. So it's very short term and decisions that you make, uh, unless you're in special clubs who really kind of give you the time and the patience to, to build things. Nowadays, in most uh, clubs or leagues or countries, if you lose four or five games in a row, then you can pack your bags. So to think short, like long-term or middle-term is very difficult as a coach nowadays. And also because I, I feel that I can learn a lot. I learn a lot, a lot of times what I've learned as a, as a sport director, to think a little bit more far than only this game. And um, also when I solve a problem, you know, um, as a coach, you sometimes you can think uh, immediate and emotional. And as a sport director, you try to tend to look for a little bit uh, for the middle term also. Um, and that's part that I like. I'm kind of mixing the two things. Uh, the only thing I've never been such a good planner uh, in regards to my own future. So I think for myself that uh, in the end, uh, whatever will happen, whatever destiny will decide, I'll try to be ready for it. And uh, as long as I enjoy it, I'm happy. And I remember when I came to Israel, I expected to be two years and I ended up staying here six years because I enjoyed it. I learned also a lot from, from the owner of Maccabi, who was, you know, as everybody knows, is a successful businessman. And he gave me different thoughts. He asked me completely different questions, a lot of times not related directly to, to, to football performance, but I felt I always kept learning. And as, as long as I enjoy myself, then I'm, I'm happy in places. So I'm open for different things that will come, like I've always been, and I'll always try to be ready for any challenge uh, that comes. And I just try to be ready by mixing, as I said before, the experience of, of different places in the table, different football experiences from coaching, from player, from sport director, and try to be ready. Very good answer. Perhaps I'm, I, I'm allowed to add something. I think one of the best sport directors in Europe, Andy Roxborough, the former um, technical director of UEFA said, the difference between sport director and coaches, the coach always wants to win the next game, the sports director the next decade. I think it's a good, it's a good answer. Um, yeah. May I ask you, uh, when I come to the professional coach or the coach in high uh, amateur leagues, what would you say are the most important competences of a modern coach? I uh, will say uh, yes. something that, um, like, I think it's a little bit of a, a trend that I... I feel it's happening. I find it even a little bit almost an unfair trend. Um, I think somebody who knows a lot about football, a lot about exercise, exercises, a lot about uh, being good on the grass. Nowadays, a lot of those characteristics are becoming assistants. And 
not any more head coaches. And I think now there's a tendency in, in, in football, which probably it's, it's unfair. Up to a certain point, it is unfair. But I think uh, clubs are looking for leaders as head coach. It's not anymore about what you know as a coach to be a head coach, but it's about your man management skills. How do you solve problems? Are you a good communicator? Are you a good motivator? Uh, do you understand that in the youth, yes, there is one rule for everybody, for all the players, but when you already reach the professional stage, every player is different. Every ego is different. So there's not any more one rule for everyone, but everyone, it's like a different problem to solve. And uh, normally the most complicated characters as football players are also the ones that normally win or lose the games. So from the good management skill, man management skills with them. So that's something that I, I hope it will change because normally, you know, a lot of coaches nowadays are, are getting really well prepared. If you ask them a certain exercise, they can give you a whole menu of exercises. And that's the essence of football. You know, you have a plan for the weekend and, and on, from Monday to Friday, you try to step-by-step step implement for what, first of all, to correct mistakes from the last game, but also to prepare the next game. And as I said before, nowadays, there is a kind of a tendency to, to that coaches, the head coach starts to be more uh, a leading figure in a dressing room, more than being a specialist of exercises and, and, and uh, understanding what I mean with the grass, you know, like the, 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 the grass, like, okay, uh, it's, it's half meter there, your angle of your body needs to be like this, so when you receive the ball, you can see the other side. You know, all these things nowadays, uh, it's work of staff. But I do think there's a tendency of head coaches every time are more and more uh, being judged by their capacity of, of leadership, of convincing everybody to go the same path, the same way. Maybe unfair, but there is a, a tendency to it. But uh, I think also, again, a very, very good answer. It's not enough uh, the football competency nowadays. Uh, the personality, the social competences, this is in, in, in top clubs, it's necessary because other, without this, only to speak about uh, the knowledge of football, it's not enough. And to lead also here a, a staff of uh, 30, 40 people, it's not enough to know football. It's also the personal competences and the social competences are necessary. Jody, let's go a little bit to the game because it's also important for the coaches. Um, can you describe in, in some keywords your philosophy of football, how to play football? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, there's not many coaches who, with a certain very direct philosophy, can actually choose the clubs where they want to work, who have the same philosophy. I mean, yes, Guardiola, of course, is a very... Uh, easy example, but Guardiola, you know, he had Barcelona, he worked in, in Bayern München, uh, now in Man City, and he knew, you know, that these squads were um, full of players who were dominant, who were proactive players, who, who play from possession. And of course, uh, most coaches, probably we don't have that kind of choice. So we find ourselves adapting constantly to the necessities what we have. Uh, and, and the material that we have. And for example, uh, I was uh, coaching one year in, in Maccabi, who normally, uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv, who normally uh, have the obligation to dominate games, uh, to play from behind, um, already from the goalkeeper, to try to open the spaces with combination football, try to reach to the last third. And then I went to China thinking the same thing, but I was in a, a relegation battle team who was not used to playing football from behind. So there was a moment we tried to play football. Uh, of course, we got punished, uh, I think, with a 0-4. And uh, then I think we luckily drew a game that we could have lost uh, with four goals difference. And then it was a moment that I spoke to the staff. And I said, listen, if we want to continue our own way, then probably we'll be on the plane home very soon. But if we want to succeed, we'll have to adapt certain things. And it means we cannot build up from behind because we don't have the confidence. The team is, is, has not won many games, so we're not playing with the confidence. So we need to bring the ball 
to uh, our best players. And our best players were, at that time, the foreigners that we had in attack. So we just had to kind of skip the first line, uh, not playing from behind and trying to win the second ball in the opponent half and play from there. And that's how we survived in the end. Uh, of course, I love to, to play the dominant football, uh, playing from behind. I would love goalkeepers who play. I would love fullbacks who go up. I would love uh, central defenders who can, can find with through passes uh, the midfielders who will turn. Of course, we all dream about that. Um, one thing that I do think is important, uh, and I think you've mentioned that also many times, is the rest defense. No matter how you play football, rest defense is a vital part nowadays of successful teams. No matter you're an attacking team, if you're a counter-attack team, rest defense, it's, uh, it's when the team is attacking that you are already prepared to stop as quick as possible the transition of the opponent, being by good positioning you can steal the ball, or by the last option, of course, is to make a tactical foul if necessary without getting a stupid yellow card. But I think um, that is an aspect that no matter what team you work in, no matter what your philosophy is, uh, that is one of the keys to having success. But again, yes, I like possession. I like wingers who play on the outside. I love attacking midfielders who run in the space, who can score goals from the second line. But again, not always as a coach, we have the choice uh, of the club that really fits our philosophy or that is a good fit. Nowadays, it's really difficult. So I think it's important for coaches to be ready to be open-minded, to adapt yourself to what your team and the material that you have at that moment in the squad, to adapt to what you have. Yeah. Last question from my side. Um, and I must uh, ask uh, this question to you uh, about the development of players, because uh, you have been also responsible for this development process in Maccabi Tel Aviv, and you know uh, what's going on in La Masia, you know what's going on in the development process all over the world. Um, when you, when you have to give advices for Israel uh, for the development process, which advices would you give? Well, I think uh, yeah, yeah. I, when, I, when I look at the Israeli football player and also a little bit uh, the youth, of course, I've been gone on now. A few uh, I think some things have improved. I've always thought that uh, the Israeli player was comfortable on the ball. Like uh, going forward and, uh, and if they need to dribble. It's not a coincidence that now, uh, you know, it's, it's a welcome headache. But the main headache for the national team coach is now to, you know, how do you put all this offensive talent uh, together? Because as you said before, you have a, a player now in, in, in Valladolid in Spain. Uh, you have a player in, in, in the Bundesliga with uh, Dabur. You have uh, Iran who is, the, you know, Absolute number one, both mentally, everything. He, he just has it all. Wherever he goes, he's, uh, he does what he needs to do. Then you have a player in, in Shakhtar with Salomon. You know, and then I don't want to leave anybody uh, out, but you have four or five incredible good options. So I don't think at the moment uh, the main problem in, of Israeli football or the main uh, improving points are, I think it's more to try to teach um, the younger generations that it's not a shame to be a, a defender nowadays. Yeah. It's a vital part for the attackers to win. They need a good, you know, a good line of defenders behind them because, as you said before, if you can see two, uh, two goals uh, a game, probably you don't have a lot of chance to win games because you need to score at least uh, three. You know? And it's difficult to score three every single game. So I think it's a part that has to be a little bit more attention to uh, yes, my father, uh, for example, he really liked defenders who, who, who would build up, for sure. But he also liked defenders who could uh, win duels against the strikers, who were maybe faster or who arrived to the ball before the opponent strikers. And I personally, uh, and this was more in Israel without saying names, I, you know, when we played um, short games, for example, in training, and a defender, a central defender, would score three goals, and he would think he had a good training. But that's not your job. If your striker scored four goals, then I'm sorry, you scored three, but for me it's not enough. Because your job is, in the end, to prevent. And how many times have we not seen in the last five, six years, both in, in, in European club competition or national team, 
that 15, 20 minutes before the end of the game, you, you're winning the result. You're winning with a goal difference. And when the final whistle goes, either you draw or, or you lost. So there is a component of if we really want to compete, if we win it, really want to win, we also need to understand the importance of defending and not only of attacking. And Israel at this moment has the good attackers, you know, and as I said, in top leagues. So that is not the problem. Now it's time to show young players uh, already at the age of, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, that to be a good defender, you know, to be Pujol, to be a Ramos, you know, these are amazing things. This is also, they made huge careers with doing the different kind of job. Uh, the other part, I think physical, I personally, from the outside, I do see improvement. I see that, uh, you know, you're starting to play against other countries and you can compete with them, both in dynamics up and down, both in transitions, but also in aerial duels. It's, it's, the, the gap is closing and I think that's also going to be helpful for Israeli football. And I think the main thing, of course, is still going to be tactical and, and especially mental. Uh, you know, parents of youth players need to understand that they're not the coach. You know, let the coach be the one. You still hear a lot of parents uh, in football games shouting to the son what he needs to do when that's actually the job of the coach who's supposed to be specialist for this. That was, I'm just giving examples from my own time in, in, in Israel, from my own views, what I've seen um, and what kind of disturbed me when I was watching games that I thought, come on, you know, let the coach do their job, especially in the youth, because the youth clubs or youth teams are not only developing a player, but also a person, which has to have, uh, you know, solidarity, a team spirit uh, to help the one beside you when he has a bad day, a uh, bad day to lift him up when he's down, all these kind of things. And, and I do think it's, it's growing. There is a tendency and I do feel that the improvement from the Outside again, uh, I am seeing an improvement in, in Israeli football and I hope it continues with this tendency because there's nothing more that I would like to see the, a lot of uh, clubs participating in European competition and also that the national team keeps fighting like in the last uh, tournaments to, or the last uh, qualifiers to try to make that last step. And then I do see that it, there's an improvement and it's getting closer and closer all the time. So, Adaba, for your compliments and for this feedback, I think also this education in the football part, in offense and defense and transition, the total footballer, as your father said. And also my father, sorry to interrupt, my father always said that a football, a foot, uh, football game takes 90 minutes. Yeah. And a football player, by average, has the ball two minutes. Yeah. So, why do you do the other 88 minutes? You know, and uh, are the two minutes more important than the 88 minutes? Probably for Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi, yes. But for most of the players, it's yeah. about uh, uh, both aspects of the game that you need to be a team player for both aspects. Yes, but uh, uh, what I wanted to say, this education process in football, you mentioned also the importance in the mental part, the personality, uh, the fitness, and also the lifestyle and the conditioning. I think this is this is really what we have to improve in our academies uh, and development centers. Jordi, there is one question of, on, uh, coming out of the auditorium. It's Lior Rebla. And please, I would ask him uh, to ask a question. He is now, okay, Lior, can you, can you ask? Hi, Jordi. Hi. How are you? Hi, everybody. First of all, uh, I will ask the, uh, the, the question in Hebrew. Okay, then I, uh, in English. I want to ask you a question, Jordi, to ask two questions, but let's start with the first question. What are the new ones that he has in the game in the game of the game? Jordi, um, actually I have two questions, but let's begin with, with the first one, or one. In your opinion, uh, what are the main new trends uh, you personally have identified in recent years in the tactical aspects of the game? Um, if you see a lot of games, I think that, uh, especially the Champions League games and all these games, you see a lot of uh, interaction of positions of, of players. Like uh, nowadays, a fullback is not only staying anymore in his, uh, you know, in his area. He's moving up. You see strikers who come in the ball. You 
see more and more midfielders making runs behind the striker. And I think it's more fast and more dynamic. And uh, if I see, for example, uh, yesterday, watch a lot of Champions League games and you see more and more and more chances. I also enjoy to see that um, some teams, how they play football in, in, in the stadium or in, on the, on the, in, in, in away games of the big teams and they play open football and they try to build up from behind. And I'm, I must say, I'm really positively surprised with that tendency. They know they're probably going to lose when they play open football against a team that's much better than you. But at least they try. And maybe they will not see the result in that specific game, but they are developing kind of a, a, a mentality of, I'm not afraid to the players, that I'm not afraid to try to play face-to-face -face against my opponent. I'm not going to show that I'm afraid. I'm not going to show any... I know they're better, but I'm not going to show it. I'm going to play open football. And that aspect for me has been one of the tendons when I watch all kinds of European leagues. If I watch uh, Holland or Germany, Holland has always been a little bit like that. But even when I watch Spanish football, I see more and more teams who, who maybe are battling relegation, who play open, who play to win. They play playing from behind. And I think it's, it's a very good tendency, especially because for players, they're learning the total football. They're learning uh, to be good in possession and also without possession. And they're trying to be creative. And it's, hopefully it's going to bring more dribblers into football again because the last decade or so, it's hard to find pure dribblers nowadays. And I think the tendency is, uh, I like it. I think it's going to be positive and I hope that's going to be a continuous trend. No matter what system, if you play even with five at the back, but if two of them are playing in front of the striker, you're already not really playing with five at the back. So the tactical... It doesn't really matter. It's about uh, the intention of playing to win. Jody, um, thanks. I want to thank you for this interview. It was a pleasure to have you here. And it was really a first highlight in this uh, two days uh, conference, we assume. And I think on behalf of all coaches here, we wish you personally all the best as in the upcoming career as a sports director or coach, whatever you want. And uh, I personally always be happy to meet you if it is in Tel Aviv, in Barcelona or in Austria. It's wonderful to discuss with you. All the best. Thank you very much to everyone. Yeah. Thank you.